Have you been diagnosed with depression and struggle with sadness? Maybe you're scared of being criticized. Loss of interest, aches and pain. I'm always thinking something terrible. Ask your gonna... doctor about effects or exercise. Ask your doctor about Symbolta. Talk to your doctor about Zoloft. So talk to your healthcare professional. Talk your doctor oh, today. Your doctor. Tell your doctor. Contact your doctor immediately. Talk with your doctor. <laughs> Over 40 years ago, leading psychiatrists met in Puerto Rico to map out their vision of the future. We see a developing potential for nearly a total control of human emotional status, mental functioning, and will to act. Their plan? To create by the year 2000 a range of psychiatric drugs regulating every aspect of human behavior. I was uh, diagnosed with uh, depression and put on Paxil. ADD, and I was prescribed Ritalin. General anxiety disorder. Prescribed Zoloft. Bipolar disorder, and I take lithium. PTSD, Zoloft. I was on Paxil. When they placed me on Zoloft. They gave me Adderall. I was prescribed Cyptomu. Tegretol. Lexapro. Debaco. Stelazine. Adderall. Concerta. Thorazine. Prozac. Lorazepam. Epixol. Clonazepam. The Ritalin. Dexafetamine. Paxil. Silert. Prozac. The Adderall. Elevil. Depico, Wilbutrin, Seroquel. Etc. Etc. 100 million people worldwide are on psychiatric drugs. How did this happen? Psychiatrists convinced them they were sick. They want you to think you're diseased from birth, and that all those experiences of life, childhood and adolescence and teenage years and adulthood and being a senior citizen, that these are all various stages of disease. Because let's face it, we've all been depressed at one time. We've all been anxious at one time. These are normal emotions that we feel. Every emotional and spiritual problem is reduced to a label. And of course, all of those diseases require pharmaceutical treatments. This is big, big business. While generating a healthy income, claiming to be medical professionals, psychiatrists will freely confess that their profession is devoid of science. We don't really have any specific blood tests or other tests that are definitive for any mental illness whatsoever. It would be neat if it would become much more scientific. Well, if you go to my office and you tell me that you're depressed, there's nothing and no blood sample or whatever, no tests. There are not uh, current available tests uh, to verify your diagnosis. I don't use any tests. Do not have a test to say, well, this is this disorder and this is the best medication for this disorder. For many years, we thought we had the tests nailed down, but it turned out that they weren't of any value. If you don't know what's causing the symptoms, then to give somebody something to alleviate the symptoms is close to impossible. By the time a drug's approved and it hits the general population, we don't know even 50% of the side effects that are involved with that drug. And these pills cause heart attacks and liver problems and immune system problems and lots of other medical problems. So you're playing with fire. Every day, psychotropic drugs cause serious adverse reactions. And while psychiatrists and drug companies fully understand the dangers of the drugs they sell, their unsuspecting customers are left to suffer the consequences. Everything became worse, Every, uh, you know, each, each mood swing was worse. He would have chronic headaches, chronic, you know, nausea, not feeling good. She was very agitated, uh, very, very jumpy. She was having horrible hallucinations. Her personality was um, disintegrating. Once he started on that drug, he just, the cloud just stayed over him and stayed over him and stayed over him. It got darker and darker. He thought there wasn't anything worth living to kill himself. That was not Matthew. That was the drugs. At least I would like to have said, I love you. I didn't get a chance to do that. In addition to crippling scores of people daily, every month, psychiatric drugs kill an estimated 3,000. But the human devastation would never have gotten this high if psychiatrists hadn't worked hand in hand with drug companies to promote their drugs to doctors throughout the world. Today, 70% of all psychiatric drugs are prescribed by general physicians. And how was this accomplished? Marketing. It's about creating a good story that uses science that convinces a physician 
to think about writing a prescription. This is not science. This is incredibly effective marketing. It has nothing to do with science. They use what I call statistical contortionism. Basically just skew the numbers, make everything look fantastic. You hide the bad numbers. They're learning every trick in the book. They're evolving into efficient marketing machines. And it's working. There's definitely an unholy alliance between psychiatry and pharmaceutical sales. That's a marriage made in heaven. They're like conjoined twins. They're joined at the wallet. And with 374 mental disorders filling psychiatry's diagnostic manual and more on the way, business is booming. Pharmaceutical companies have expanded their roster of psychotropic drugs from 44 in 1966 to 174 today. The top five psychotropic drugs combined gross more money than the gross national product of each of over half the countries on Earth. Altogether, the psychiatric industry rakes in a third of a trillion dollars a year. How could this have happened? It's a tale of deception that may be difficult to believe, but fatal to ignore. We took him to a psychiatrist, and within a matter of minutes, yeah, she's ADHD, and here's your drug. Went on the Medicaid, and five minutes later, he was on Zyprexa. He saw the psychiatrist who prescribed the medicine for 20 minutes. The guy didn't even look at her. He talked to her a little bit. Now, how can you tell if somebody's ADHD or not ADHD from just a few minutes talking to her? Next thing I know, I'm getting handed a, a handful of Xanax. That's how easy it is to get these drugs. Just so easy, it's just passed to me like candy. It's that simple. If a person were to walk in off the street, sit down with a psychiatrist, the chances of him being prescribed a drug before he were to leave the office, I would have to put it at 100%. Psychiatrists prescribe drugs. They might have different ways of diagnosing, they might have different ways of interacting with a patient, but it's rare to find a psychiatrist that uses no drugs. The psychiatrists today are, in quotes, admitting they can't cure these mental illnesses and they're therefore going to manage your illness by using a drug. Fifty years ago, a person who was going through a divorce would have relied on family, friends, clergy, and even the family doctor to a certain extent for conversation to work through the issue. They certainly wouldn't have been medicated. That was before the era of psychotropic drugs. Psychiatrists, occupying the lowest rung of the medical profession, worked almost exclusively in mental institutions. With no cures, there was little chance they would ever be respected by the public and their peers as real doctors. Psychiatrists had for years been on the fringe of medicine. Typically, the standard doctor internist would have very low regard for psychiatrists because it was understood not to be a very clear uh, science or art. Psychiatrists wanted to be viewed as physicians, as doctors. And in order to be viewed as physicians and doctors, the people they dealt with had to be viewed as patients. And if doctors dealt with diseases, then their patients had to be diseased. Psychiatrists had a wonderful opportunity, they felt, to become respected in the eyes of their peers. They raced to create a whole diagnostic book called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which was created by consensus. A group of psychologists and psychiatrists get together and if they have made common observations, they have a vote and they now classify a new disease. And they give it a number and it graduates into the DSM classification. And it's a dangerous book. It's a book that has many disorders that could apply to any one of us because the disorders are not real medical diseases. And it's things that apply to nearly all of us at times. Are you afraid of meeting new people? Are you afraid to speak in front of a large crowd of people? Uh, does it make you nervous to go and to talk to your boss about a complaint? You can invent a mental disorder based on a checklist of symptoms, and that is exactly how the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the billing bible for psychiatry, works. Since the DSM's first edition in 1952, the number of diagnoses has steadily grown. 
from a slender 130-page booklet listing 106 so-called mental disorders, the DSM has bloated to a voluminous 886 pages. It is only through the use of this book that psychiatrists can diagnose, drug, and bill for services. In fact, the psychiatric industry currently uses the DSM to collect over $72 billion in private and government insurance money. The DSM is used to diagnose and then give a label, and the label is used for billing purposes. That's how they get paid. You have to have a term in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in order to then call it a disease and treat it as a disease and write a prescription for it. And so because they can vote it in, they can create, and then the drug industry can just take over and market their drugs for those new disorders. And those drugs were welcomed by psychiatry leaders because it made us real doctors. Of course, first the public had to believe that there was something wrong with them and that that thing wrong was biochemical and that that could then be treated by a drug which was supposed to cure all. And so it was relatively easy, I think, to say, well, look, let's start looking at mental illness as fundamentally um, a matter of chemical imbalance in the brain. Chemical imbalance is a term that's used as a marketing ploy as opposed to anything that there's scientific evidence to support. Nobody has yet measured, demonstrated, or created a test to show that somebody has a chemical imbalance in their brain, period. How do you market a drug that restores the chemical balance or corrects a chemical imbalance? How can you do that? in good conscience if you don't even know what one is. The whole myth of the chemical imbalance was created to sell drugs. And while psychiatrists and drug companies have used this myth to make billions moving vast quantities of psychotropic drugs into the bodies of unsuspecting consumers, the public has paid the ultimate price. An estimated half of all Americans who commit suicide are on psychotropic drugs. Annually, psychotropic drugs are estimated to kill more than two and a half times more people than are killed by homicide. And who is entrusted with protecting the public against these dangerous psychotropic drugs? In the United States, it is the Food and Drug Administration, FDA whose psychiatric drug advisory panels are dominated by psychiatrists who shuttle between the drug industry, academia, private practice, and government, the so-called revolving door. The revolving door at FDA is one of the primary reasons why the system that we have works so poorly. That revolving door is a direct result of the fact that a group of people with the same mindset are put into positions of being regulators and in the position of being formulators and sellers and marketers. The panels that are formed by the FDA to evaluate these drugs, the psychiatrists who are on those panels, almost all of them have conflicts of interest where they have directly or indirectly received funding from the very industry and the very parties within the industry whose drugs they are evaluating. So there's this, this tight little relationship between psychiatry, pharmaceutical industry, and FDA, where they each mutually support each other, and yet the mental health of the population does not improve. Take, for example, the FDA drug evaluation panel that approved the antidepressant Paxil. Every psychiatrist on that panel has financial ties to the pharmaceutical industry. And these conflicts of interest have been rampant enough to prompt congressional investigation. When I check these advisory committees who make recommendations to the FDA, and they're always approved, always approved after the advisory committee, I found that there were conflicts of interest. I found that many of the people on the advisory committees had never filed a proper report on stocks and bonds that they owned that, that might uh, be viewed as a conflict of interest, and they're by law supposed to do that. And this network of financial conflict of interest between psychiatry, the drug industry, and the FDA became even more entrenched in 1992, after passage of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, also known as PDUFA. Through this bill, 
the FDA would be paid a fee of $100,000 per drug to ensure that psychotropic medications would be rushed through the approval process and into the hands of prescribers faster than ever. Congress told the FDA, your job is no longer to make sure drugs are squeaky clean safe before they get out on the market. Your job now is to hurry up and get new drugs on the market faster. It acted to set the priorities of the FDA so that if there was a fee paid for a particular drug approval, it could be put on the fast track and rushed to market with less than the usual scrutiny that the FDA would give it. And this fast track has traded safety for sales. Since the passage of PDUFA, time spent on drug evaluation plunged from almost two years in 1992 to only six months four years later. Meanwhile, the number of new drugs released to the public doubled. Though fast-tracking is disastrous for public safety, it reaps huge profits for psychiatry and the drug industry. Because the sooner a drug is approved, the sooner it makes money. And the money is big. Every day, the average psychotropic drug grosses over $7.7 .7 million. One drug, Zyprexa, rakes in almost $12 million daily. And even though FDA now charges over $1 million per new drug application, the pharmaceutical fast track shows no signs of slowing. If you look at the relationship between the FDA, the pharmaceutical industry, and the psychiatrists, there's some kind of game that they're playing there. And what is the game? Well, you could say it's money, definitely money. And when you follow the money, you realize that there is no money in health there's big money in disease. That's why all you hear about is managing disease or treating disease. You don't really talk about curing disease. And so psychiatrists have become mainstream doctors in America. And that is because of the pharmaceutical industry. They can thank the pharmaceutical industry because they become mainstream and because they have a lot more money than they used to. And the drug industry can thank them because now they have thousands of soldiers in their army distributing these drugs to everybody. From the smallest infant to the oldest senior citizen, no one is immune from any of the hundreds of fictitious disorders invented by psychiatrists that fuel a multi-billion dollar psychotropic drug industry. And every day, psychiatrists are casting their nets ever wider. And all it takes? Another psychiatric label. How many people do you know who have been diagnosed with a mental disorder? One. With a mental disorder? Um, two. I'm sure a couple. I know a few. About three or four personally. Probably four. Half a dozen? I'll say about nine. At least a dozen. I'll bet I could count 15. 20, but I personally know. My uh, oldest son is diagnosed. My mother was diagnosed. Kid from uh, my childhood. Your friend the next one. Just my grandfather and cousins, a friend of mine, friends. My sister, my neighbors. Two friends, a girlfriend. A nice one friend. My mother. Is All my friends, everybody I know. An apparent flood of mental illness is all around us. Where is this coming from? Psychiatrists, whose diagnostic and statistical manual can label anyone walking the earth today as mentally ill. Psychiatrists, I believe, they look at every human being and they divide humans into two classes, clients and potential clients. We see this no more uh, prevalent in any field than in the field of the mental disorders, where one disease after another is invented and then popularized and the public is made to worry about it. It's a disease mongering. It's the selling of sickness. You know, sometimes it's a, it's a drug in search of a market and it's giving public awareness to minor conditions with the ultimate goal is to sell more medications. It's not caring for people. When you run out of symptoms, you don't have any more clientele to market to. So you have to invent disease. And with psychiatric medications, you can invent diseases all day long. Look at human variation. Everyday things like shyness, um, sadness, or even a situational 
depressions um, like grieving, postpartum depression, they all become studied and prescriptions start to get written for these drugs. Before these drugs were introduced in the market, people who had these conditions would not have been given any drug at all. And so it is the branding of a disease and it is the branding of a drug for the treatment of a disease that did not exist before the industry made the disease. Case in point, shyness, a common life situation voted by psychiatrists into their diagnostic and statistical manual under the name social anxiety disorder. You know, people are nervous. Well, they come up with, say, um, social anxiety disorder. SAD, they'll call it SAD. And the connotation is that everybody ought to be happy and that here's a drug that can make you happy. Uh, so that a common occurrence, which is every now and again everybody's sad, we ought to be treating with a drug. Well, then they'll get this PR firm to um, drum up uh, business for this. They'll put out all these studies that find, you know, there's so many people afflicted with this sad, you know, and they'll start putting it in magazines, they'll start putting it on TV, they'll start a patient advocacy group that say, you know, that we're all affected by this, and, and then they'll come out with Paxil works for this. So they go to the FDA and they said, well, we ran this study and this works for this new invented disorder. And that is sad, social anxiety disorder. And millions of people suffer from it. And it's purely fictional. It's, it's a normal human emotion that everybody experiences at certain times or another, but they make it into a disease. Paxil, once it got approved by the FDA as the first antidepressant to be used for social anxiety, it took off huge and um, it just moved from number three in the market amongst its peer drugs to number one in the market. Social anxiety disorder is just one of many made-up psychiatric disorders fueling the boom in psychotropic drug prescription. Psychiatrists work to promote what the latest disease is going to be. These days, bipolar is getting that same type of promotion. Everybody's being educated about their bipolar illness. When in fact, we know having emotional ups and downs is distinctly human. Now bipolar is thrown around like water. You've got bipolar, I have bipolar. If I'm up today, I'm, I'm manic. If I go home tonight and I'm depressed because I'm tired, that shows I have bipolar disease. It's a lot of hokum. Have you ever worried um, with seeing all the increased media on it that you might have a mental disorder? Yes. And which one is that? I would say bipolar. You know, they talk about bipolar a lot. Bipolar, I've known a lot of bipolar. Two friends, from uh, both of them were like diagnosed with bipolar. Uh, my neighbor, she was bipolar. I was diagnosed with bipolar. My mother had bipolar. He was actually bipolar. Schizophrenic bipolar. <laughs> bipolar and obsessive compulsive. Bipolar and ADHD. Bipolar disorder. Bipolar, yeah. Bipolar situation. Bipolar. 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 There are three personality disorders, and then the most recent is bipolar. And that's just been in the past year. Spearheading the popularizing of bipolar disorder, especially in children, is psychiatrist Dr. Joseph Biederman a paid speaker, advisor, and researcher for 25 different drug companies. In 1996, the drug companies funneled all this money to this Dr. Biederman, he's well known. He's the one that came up and said that there's bipolar disorder in little kids. This was unheard of. There was no bipolar disorder in any kids. He came up with the study and published the articles out all over the world, and other doctors followed his lead that bipolar is in little kids. Due to the constant promotion by Dr. Biederman and his colleagues, there has been a 4,000% increase of the diagnosis of bipolar in children since 1994, while the number of antipsychotics prescribed to them has leaped fivefold to an estimated 2.5 million prescriptions. In 2008, Dr. Biederman was exposed by a Senate investigation for failing to report $1.6 million in personal income from pharmaceutical companies. But the damage had been done. Because of the bipolar fad created by Dr. Biederman, antipsychotics, some of the most powerful psychotropic drugs being prescribed, are psychiatry's drug of choice. 
the top three best-selling antipsychotics together grows $25,000 every minute. And no matter how big the psychotropic drug industry gets, psychiatrists are hard at work providing the diagnoses to make it even bigger. Let's say this is the pie right here of the um, of a certain class of medications. And this is a pretty profitable pie and everybody wants a piece of that pie. Um, but what would happen if we made that pie even bigger? And how you make the pie even bigger is by expanding the uses for those drugs. They've already got a drug that's approved on the shelf. They can just pull it off the shelf, and rename it, repackage it, and say, look, we've got a new drug for a new illness. When Prozac's patent ran out, that Eli Lilly had to look for a new source of profits. So all they did was change the name of the drug from Prozac to Seraphim, changed the color of the pill from green to pink, and marketed it for PMDD, which is newly introduced into this book. What it tells us is that you, if you can come up with a label, a diagnostic label, for a drug, then you can sell it like hotcakes. It's a business model, and it's a billion dollar business model, and it works, and it's gonna keep continuing. Today, anyone may unknowingly be taking a psychiatric drug, renamed, repackaged, and prescribed for non-psychiatric purposes. Zyban, prescribed as a cure for smoking, is actually the antidepressant Welbutrin. Cymbalta, a psychiatric drug for depression and anxiety, is now being marketed as Yendrive for urinary incontinence. Psychiatric researchers are testing psychotropic drugs on such wildly varying conditions as obesity, alcoholism, gambling, hot flashes, herpes, nausea, itching, shivering, and excessive hair pulling. It is a pill for every ill and practically no one is being told how dangerous psychiatric drugs are. As a chemist, I'm making these drugs. They're proving deadly in our labs, and they're proving deadly in other labs. Dangerous, ineffective, causing the exact same thing they're supposed to treat. How are they selling them? For anyone who's given a label of a psychotic illness, drugs seem to be the automatic choice of treatments as night follows day. That's all psychiatry does. It's dominated by psychopharmacologists who do nothing but manage symptoms by dispensing pills. That's it. And they don't work. But the fact that they don't work works to the advantage of the drunk companies and the psychiatrists, which means that you're not cured, which means that you're a patient for life, you're a customer, you're a client for life. And the worse your health gets, the more drugs you need. It's it's a great deal for them. We should all be up in arms about the way we're being treated by psychiatry today. This is a very dangerous industry that has gone so far overboard in inventing fictitious diseases and drugging our children and our population that I consider it to be engaged in crimes against humanity. With over $80 billion a year in psychiatric drug money at stake, it is impossible to escape the saturation of psychiatric disease mongering in today's society. But behind the marketing lurks a secret psychiatry's customers would be shocked to learn. How are these drugs tested? And are they safe? No one knows precisely uh how the psychiatric medications uh, act. We don't know if I give you a medication, if it is going to work or not. It's not a great deal of scientific support for using them. I myself, I try to pick a drug whose side effects might be useful. You have to choose what is the best option. We don't have the sure methods. There are no rules. Everything is, it's an art, really. Often it's trial and error. It's a kind of a trial and error. It's a trial and error. Some degree of trial and error, I guess. A blind man's bluff or something like that. You yeah. never know if it's the right drug. It's a much more complex uh, subject. There's always going to be huge surprises, and that, that's what makes it so difficult. The best psychiatrists in the world will mess up all the time. The American public is being treated as a mass medical experiment. We are all being treated like guinea pigs by the pharmaceutical companies, the psychiatric industry, and the FDA. 
They are basically testing drugs on large parts of the population uh, without really knowing what the results are going to be. It's a very dire situation that we're facing. We're talking about people's health and in many situations, people's lives. These are very serious issues. As dangerous chemical compounds, psychotropic drugs are tightly regulated by governments throughout the world. And for any new psychotropic drug to be approved for use, it must undergo tests intended to protect the public. When a pharmaceutical company develops a new drug that they want to send to the market, what they do is they have to run it through clinical trials. They have to be able to provide to the FDA safety data to say this is a safe and effective drug. In clinical trials, uh, psychiatrists are engaged to do the research. And we could bank on the fact that these psychiatrists are tied to the pharmaceutical companies. And a psychiatrist puts their name on there, they're seen as an expert, talking mental drugs, who writes them, it's psychiatrists. So that's how it works. It's a terrible system. The desperate thing about it is that it's all dressed up in the name of science. It's not science at all, it's, it's pure marketing. Uh, but they get away with it because it's called science. There's really no test, no x-ray, there's no chemistry that shows you have this condition. It's really just the opinion of someone who is probably taking money from pharmaceutical companies to prescribe drugs to people. Where's the biochemistry? Where's the research? Where's the substantiation? And the answer is it vaporizes like mist in the morning. It's not there. But the lack of scientific testing doesn't stop psychiatrists from carrying out clinical trials on dangerous drugs. Clinical trials are supposed to consist of four phases of precise scientific drug testing, the first three of which must be submitted to governments for regulatory approval. In phase one, the drug is checked for toxicity. In phase two, tests are done to see how the drug reacts in the human body. If it clears this hurdle, then a phase three trial is carried out. But with no lab tests verifying or measuring any mental disorder, and with big money at stake, psychiatric drug research is highly subjective and rife with manipulation. There are many, many, many places where you can tweak the study just a little bit with the study design or with the way you gather the data or the way the data are reported. And there's so many different ways you could bias a study. I've seen what they did to the data in these trials. There's no question that they manipulated the data. For example, let's say they had 100 people to start with, 40% drop out, 30% have a positive response, 30% have no response. They then say that they have a 50% response rate when in fact, most of us would say it's a 30% response rate because only 30 out of the original 100 really responded. And so you can see that that's a little bit of a manipulation of the research data. When they design drug studies, they're only looking at the one thing they want to they see. And they don't report all the other things that are happening. Case in point, the antidepressant Cymbalta. Lily, I believe in February of 2004, did a clinical trial study. The people in this clinical trial did not have symptoms of depression. And in that clinical trial, there were 11 attempted suicides and four suicides completed. One of which was Tracy Johnson, 19-year-old college girl. She did not have any symptoms of depression. And yet this drug pushed her to commit suicide by hanging herself. That shoots the theory down that they say that, you know, people get suicidal because of the, you know, underlying illness that people kill themselves, that these weren't suicidal people to begin with. These weren't depressed at all. These were healthy people. A slew of media coverage followed, but psychiatrists on the FDA drug evaluation panel chose to ignore the death and went on to approve Cymbalta the following August. One of the reasons why we have underestimated the potential of some psychiatric uh, antidepressant drugs to actually trigger a suicidal kind of behavior in people is because the people who designed the research study didn't include in the research questionnaire the suicidal behavior. And then you can report that we had zero incidence of this type of behavior among our subjects. And then the response is trumpeted as if there's something magical about it, when in fact what's happened is a whole statistical 
tap dance routine that violates good science. However, on the basis of that kind of phony trial, the drug can be marketed. Keep in mind that when a drug is tested in the clinical trials, it's only a very short period of time. The final phase of testing can be anywhere from five to six weeks. The longest of those studies was eight weeks. The shortest was four weeks. So these are not long-term studies. I think most physicians and most people taking the drugs assume they're long-term, one year, two years, three year studies. They're not. They're very, very short studies. I find it pretty outrageous that we can base a multi-billion dollar industry on a few six or eight week clinical trials where antidepressant medications beat a sugar pill by a few percentage points. It is on the basis of biased research such as this that psychotropics with potentially fatal side effects are routinely approved by FDA panels for a lifetime of use. And how can this happen? Because drugs are big money and FDA panels are dominated by those who benefit by approving them. The FDA panels that evaluate these drugs are largely psychiatrists. All of a sudden you discover there are 20 different pharmaceutical companies paying them, either grants or honorary or some other way. They're getting paid by the pharmaceutical industry. If you have a psychiatrist who works at the FDA, he could also be being paid by industry. He might sit on industry panels or discussions or get paid to be a speaker. What I found in working with the physicians at the FDA was that they, it, they could have dual positions. They could sit on an industry board. They could be influenced by industry. If you've got 10 FDA scientists or 10 committee members, it's just a matter of six saying yes, the drug is safe, four saying no. And in almost every single case, those six saying that the drug is safe and effective always have pharmaceutical ties. They're getting paid, they're getting funded, somehow or another. Have you been diagnosed with depression and struggle with sadness, trouble sleeping, anxiety, or low energy? Ask your doctor about Effexor XR. With phase three approval of foregone conclusion, the marketing blitz begins. But while psychiatrists have already begun promoting and prescribing these drugs throughout the world, there's one more phase yet to be carried out, phase four. What phase four clinical trials are is when they've actually gotten the drug approved and then they get it into the general population so that we finally find out what it does when it hits ethnic populations, women, children. Then we see who dies who has seizures, who has deformed children, who has epilepsy, who has diseases downstream, whose heart stops. The public is the clinical trial. That's where we find out the problems with these drugs. This is an experimental stage. And it's so much so that one consumer protection group has advised patients that they refuse a prescription for any drug that hasn't already been on the market for seven years. So if you're taking a drug that's only been out for a year or two or three, you are a guinea pig. And the experimentation doesn't end here. Additional psychiatric drug trials take advantage of the invented disorders in psychiatry's diagnostic and statistical manual to rake in even more profits by targeting the most innocent of all. If they test their drugs on children, then they get a six-month extension on their exclusivity period or patent period. This psychiatric drug research center in Texas uses advertisements to lure in child volunteers. And once inside, they're further enticed with the simplest of tricks. This is where they're going to be playing. Yeah. We have Game Boys, we have Xbox, we have five TVs. They come in here and they help themselves to crackers, cookies, free candy, free crackers. Everything is paid for. You don't pay for anything. But these perks are just bait to coax children into ingesting powerful psychiatric drugs known to cause suicide and violence in their own age group. These are drugs that would cost maybe several hundred dollars a month in a pharmacy. They actually are getting them free in, in research. We love children and um, we just love children because they're, they're our future. By conducting those tests on children, 
they get a financial incentive that's worth over a billion dollars. Those are the facts. You make out one what you will. With this kind of money at stake, psychotropic drug experimentation on children is rampant, with 323 studies either completed or in the works, including a 2003 trial that tested children on an antidepressant treating premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Those drugs which are barely more effective than placebos often have huge side effects which are dangerous and even deadly to people. Families don't know the risk. If they actually were aware of the risk and believed it, they wouldn't, no one would take that risk. The psychiatrist would never, she didn't say one word to me about um, what was going to be the effects of the drugs. No side effects listed, no. Well, let's sit down, we have to talk about this. At that point in time, he said, well, this doesn't have that type of reaction on any children, you know, that it's very safe. If he had told me then what I know now about it, I never would have taken it. She said, oh, Beth must have been on Paxil. That's the only way she would kill herself. And I said, well, what is this? How do people know this? I didn't know anybody would know something like that. And we went on the internet, and all of a sudden, you find out this is, it's not uncommon. But it's not uncommon for people to become psychotic on these drugs. We're entitled to know the truth before we give a mind-altering drug to our children, our wife, our mother, our father, ourselves. We don't really know what they're doing. That's what scares me. It's all made up theory. There are no facts about what these drugs really do. And if someone said, well, we don't know what this is going to do to you, good or bad, would you take that medication? Now that is not the practice of medicine. That's the practice of marketing. And this practice of marketing is taking lives. And the poor patient doesn't even know it. But in the testing and marketing of psychotropic drugs, money trumps safety. The top 10 most prescribed psychotropic drugs gross over $26.5 billion annually, more than double the amount of new money put into circulation every year by the United States Mint. But to make this kind of money, psychiatrists first have to convince the most crucial market segment of all, those with the power of prescription. psychiatrists specifically, they're just kind of working as sales agents for the pharmaceutical companies. There's nothing like another doctor touting the benefits of your drug to drive market share. They're an extended part of the marketing arm of these companies. Medications play a primary role. We give drugs. Medication is a must. There's a lot of new medications. There are medications available for uh, treating DAD. Medications to use for PTSD. Antipsychotic medications. Atypical antipsychotics. Benzodiazepines. Stimulants. Antidepressant medications. MAOIs. Amphetamines. Anticonvulsant medications. And once the medications have been balanced out. Then we move on to a combination of three medicines. There's no absolute limit that is set for the number of medications. There are so many choices. Apparently, we're willing to try almost anything. Psychiatric drugs can't be sold without a prescription. So pharmaceutical companies hire psychiatrists to promote psychiatric drugs to their fellow prescribers. The money trail starts at the world's most prestigious medical schools, in the offices of highly influential, university-based, or academic psychiatrists. With their seal of approval, pharmaceutical companies make billions on psychotropic drugs. There are a lot of academic psychiatrists especially who have ties to 10 or 15 or 20 different pharmaceutical companies, and so they're making a very large amount of money. Whether they're professors or whether they work at big you know, uh, medical institutions, those drug companies will make sure that they've got them on the payroll somehow. They'll have this person feed this information to, to their other peers, uh, but it's all being motivated through monies being funded by pharmaceutical companies. About 40% of the early stage marketing dollars for pharmaceutical companies go straight to these thought leaders, psychiatrists. These financial arrangements with so-called key opinion leaders are very lucrative. A top academic psychiatrist can personally rake in over a half a million dollars per year from pharmaceutical companies. 
these people are still considered the stars of their medical centers because they bring in all this great money from the pharmaceutical companies and that helps keep the coffers of the medical center full. Universities receive a lot of money from the pharmaceutical industry. Drug companies are building buildings right next to the medical school. They're, they're funding research right and left. The University of Michigan Depression Center received, I think it was $750,000 from Eli Lilly. And all they do down there is crank out this biological view of psychiatry and mental illness and depression. With academic psychiatrists collecting millions in drug money for their universities, it is no surprise that school curricula focus on psychotropic drugs. Training programs in psychiatry, the majority of them now are drugs first. You know, you, you're really a psychopharmacologist in a way when you come out of a psych residency training program. Even when I went to medical school, psychiatry did talk to patients. Now all they do is write a prescription and send them away. A psychiatrist is trained for one purpose, to administer psychiatric drugs. Academic psychiatrists don't just indoctrinate future prescribers, they also heavily promote these drugs to their peers. First, by creating clinical trial studies, passed off as unbiased research, that push both an invented psychiatric disorder and the drug to manage it. These studies are planted in professional journals to be read by their colleagues and quoted in the media. But what readers don't know is that an estimated 50% of the time, these psychiatrists never took part in the studies. One of the most unethical practices we're aware of is ghostwriting of journal articles where somebody at the pharmaceutical company will write the paper and the academic physician will put his name on it and get it published in a major journal when he maybe changed three or four words in the whole article and the article was basically written as a marketing tool by the drug company and yet this academic puts his name on it as if he's the author. He has had no part in the study and also he probably hasn't even read the study results but he is prepared to receive ten, twenty thousand dollars to put his name at the front of the research which gives it added authority. Ghostwriting is so common that even the psychiatrist running the FDA department evaluating psychiatric drug safety has attached his name to ghostwritten articles. The average physician picks that up and reads it. He believes it. And it's not a mystery that he would believe it. It seems reasonable that it's in black and white, it's in a good journal, it's in the New England Journal of Medicine, it must be true. These journals are often sent free to psychiatrists and doctors under the guise of legitimate medical research. And why are they free? Because pharmaceutical drug ads reap huge revenues for their publishers. So if you go through a medical journal, you'll see page after page of advertising for bipolar disorder and treatment of using medications or advertising for depression and the treatment of using medications, schizophrenia. So it's, it's really everywhere. I remember just a couple of years ago the first time I opened the journal from the American Psychological Association called the APA Monitor and there was a multi-page ad, high gloss, very expensive for Concerta, which is time release Ritalin. I resigned from the American Psychological Association. I wasn't going to be part of this whatsoever. It's very hard when your major source of income is advertising and advertising placement to write an article that's negative about a particular drug and expect that company to continue to buy ads in your medical journal. So that's a major issue. But psychiatric key opinion leaders aren't satisfied with filling medical journals with ghostwritten articles. They also spread the gospel of psychotropic drugs at conferences in Continuing Medical Education, or CME. Physicians and nurse practitioners and physicians and assistants are mandated to take a certain amount of continuing education credits every year. Well, 70% of all continuing medical education is now funded by the pharmaceutical industry. That seminar is going to be taught by a professional who is employed by the pharmaceutical company. The very nature of where someone is giving you your support means you are biased to that person's side. Many physicians and many psychiatrists who attend medical conferences don't know that when they go to that conference meeting that's about antidepressants, antipsychotics, and it's generally an academic psychiatrist who's speaking, 
they don't realize that person's probably making about $10,000 for that one hour speech. But you don't have to be an academic psychiatrist to get a piece of the pie. Psychiatrists who heavily prescribe psychotropic drugs are generously rewarded by pharmaceutical sales representatives for drumming up local business. Psychiatrists, especially high prescribers, are targeted and gifted extensively by the industry. Now that gifting is where you need to get specific. That was not unusual um, during our marketing conversations to say, well, what's our top drug writer? You know, who's the doctor that's prescribing the most of this drug? Well, you know, let's send them to the Kentucky Derby. We offered trips on some occasions to come out and hear a two-hour talk, but it happened to be on a nice island in Hawaii. There were a lot of things that we did day in and day out to try to get the doctors to, to write our drugs, or in my case, to write for the psychiatric drugs. We did a lot of lunches and dinners, and we brought in speakers, and those speakers were obviously paid by us, and we would wave um, you know, renowned studies at them from renowned journals. But of course, we would never say that these, these studies were paid for by our company, and that, the, that the, it was written by a ghostwriter who was paid by our company, or that our company tends to do a ton of, of advertising within that particular medical journal, we would never say that. With over 300 million psychiatric drug prescriptions written every year, high prescribing psychiatrists are richly rewarded for opening up new markets. They receive up to 25% more pharmaceutical money than any other medical specialty, an average in one state of more than $45,000 per top psychiatrist per year. Psychiatrists get more kickback from the pharmaceutical companies than any other branch of medicine. The profession of psychiatry couldn't keep its journals afloat, couldn't keep its conferences afloat, couldn't keep its organizations afloat without money from drug companies. The drug companies really have psychiatry in their pocket. This is a profession whose diagnoses have been heavily influenced by people who are heavily influenced by the pharmaceutical industry and whose treatments are almost exclusive these days, pharmaceuticals. We should be able to count on them. I do not believe that we can. Due to the ceaseless promotion by psychiatrists, psychotropic drug prescription has permeated not just psychiatry, but the entire medical profession. But this promotional campaign has a second prong that lines the pockets of psychiatrists more than any other. And this one directly targets you. Abilify helps control symptoms of bipolar mania. Ask your doctor about Effexor XR. Paxil, the most prescribed medication of its kind. Prozac Weekly is here. Zoloft, a prescription. Seraphim. EMDD. Psychiatrists and drug companies don't hype psychiatric drugs only to fellow prescribers. They also pitch them straight to the end user, you counting on you to walk into their offices and demand a prescription. The direct-to-consumer advertising is, is instilling the notion in every human being that something is mentally wrong, something needs correction. That drives people to see a psychiatrist to help to mitigate this by dispensing the medication, by dispensing a drug that they have had pushed on them on countless television ads, countless magazine ads, and countless print ads that say, hey, there's something wrong with you, go get help for it. Nowhere is this explosion of direct-to-consumer advertising more obvious than on television. It wasn't always this way. Until recently, advertising psychiatric drugs on TV was severely restricted. But in 1997, the FDA was persuaded to relax their rules on advertising in the media, in direct violation of Article 10 of an international treaty signed at the United Nations. Every five minutes there's a new drug ad. And this, this is not by accident, this is cold, canny, scientific design. The ads are fundamentally of two types. One type of ad is a um, effort to try to get the patient to take the drug company's drug. Abilify helps control symptoms of bipolar mania. And but then the second kind of direct-to-consumer advertising is the you're sick and you didn't know it advertising. 
you could be suffering from generalized anxiety disorder. Because they want to create sales, so what they're going to do is tell people, do you have these symptoms? Do you have this disease? Do you have this particular condition? But they hit it so hard on television that people say, ask your doctor, ask your doctor. Every commercial is a referral to the doctor. See, they're working for each other. Ask your doctor about Cymbalta. Depression hurts. Cymbalta can help. I can go to my doctor and say, here are my symptoms, and walk out with the prescription I want. I can ask for a drug by name, and most of the time, I'll be given the drug. So basically, I'm my own doctor. The industry defends what it's doing by saying, this is some kind of public health education campaign. And I'm sorry, I think if you go to an advertising agency, you're advertising. From the start, advertising psychiatric drugs on television has been phenomenally successful. In just the first three years, sales of psychiatric drugs skyrocketed by 250%. With grosses now hitting record levels, the drug industry is spending $2.9 billion a year in TV advertising alone. And once this drives people into the offices of psychiatrists, they can be hooked using another marketing ploy, free samples. The industry is willing to give out millions of dollars worth of free samples because it generates billions of dollars in sales. You want a prescription and you want Prozac written forever as a maintenance therapy. So you establish that with some free Prozac up front. Here, take this sample, it doesn't cost you anything, and then if you like it or if it seems to work, then we'll make a prescription, but you're going to have to pay for that prescription, the sample is free. So it's really a, a marketing technique. They got a cash cow. Zero refill means you've got to go back to the doctor for another consultation, for another subscription, and it just goes forever. This is business. This is money. Some direct-to-consumer marketing is camouflaged as public information. Psychiatrists regularly appear in the media, warning the public of the latest mental illness epidemics and hawking their latest breakthroughs. They write articles planted in newspapers and magazines that further their mental health awareness campaigns. Even patient advocacy groups claiming to offer unbiased information on psychiatric drugs are, upon closer inspection, pharmaceutically funded front groups managed by psychiatrists. 